Yes, Dr. Akhtar, you can start now. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, welcome to our Apna Merit, um, <clears throat> another uh, wonderful uh, talk and webinar. Um, it's my pleasure that I'm welcoming on behalf of Apna Merit uh, to all of the participants and also the presenter. Uh, we have a wonderful presenter, Professor Hassan Abbas Zahir, who is uh, now WHO advisor on blood regulation and availability and safety. Before that, he was a former uh, national coordinator and project director, Safe Blood Transfusion. Uh, and he was also uh, the professor of pathology and head of pathology department, Pakistan Institute of Medical Sciences. More so, he is currently uh, is a core team member that successfully conducted the Kensio Bio COVID vaccine phase three global trial in Pakistan. And successfully implementation of this global trial led Pakistan Institute and initiated the co-manufacturing of this vaccine in NIH Islamabad through public-private partnership. I would like to welcome him to present his um, thoughts and his views about um, regarding the safety and of blood transfusion program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akhtar, uh, for your kind words. Uh, I'm very grateful to APNA for providing me an opportunity uh, to share with you our experience of uh, implementing blood safety reforms in Pakistan in the last 10 years. And I'll be talking especially in the context of research development and uh, capacity building. Um, I have no conflict of interest to declare. And uh, in this presentation, I'll briefly talk about uh, blood safety in general, and then about the blood uh, uh, transfusion scenario prior to the reforms uh, in Pakistan, and um, uh, some words about the reforms that we conducted and the achievements in terms of infrastructure development and the technical progress and what were the key features of uh, uh, this uh, reform and the way forward uh, from here onwards. So this is a very famous uh, uh, WHO slide, uh, which uh, uh, spells out the strategy for uh, safe blood transfusion. And um, this strategy basically entails three pillars of blood safety. The first pillar is complete reliance on voluntary blood donations. The second pillar is testing of all donated blood, um, including for uh, uh, infectious diseases. And the third pillar is uh, safe and rational use of all blood that is collected and processed. And these three pillars of blood safety are resting on three layers of foundations. Um, and the base layer is uh, the National Coordinated Blood Transfusion Service um, in every country, which has quality systems in place at all levels, uh, and especially a system of hemovigilance, which is surveillance of blood, uh, starting from the vein of the blood donor and ending at the vein of the uh, blood recipient. And so this is the strategy on which all the 192 member states of WHO have signed and committed to implement in their uh, respective countries. And Pakistan is one of the uh, signatory countries. And this is what, uh, we try to achieve and implement uh, through our reforms and the Safe Blood Transfusion Program. Um, and so uh, prior to the reforms uh, and to some extent even now, uh, the blood transfusion system in the country is demand driven, it is fragmented, uh, and uh, we have blood banks in the public sector and the private sector, uh, and also standalone blood banks. Some of them are small blood banks, some of them are very large and also medium-sized blood banks, and they work in isolation with each other. And uh, in all, um, we collect about uh, 2.7 million blood donations from about 650 blood banks. Um, but in addition, there are also uh, some blood banks uh, which are small in number, uh, dealing with small volumes, but uh, playing havoc with uh, blood safety. And these uh, are blood banks, which are not really blood banks, but uh, they provide blood banking services through miscellaneous settings like the doctor's clinics, uh, the pharmacy shops, uh, 
the grocery shops and cigarette shops and you know um, uh, strange places like that. Um, another problem that uh, we had uh, a lot in the past and also to some extent now is that uh, from the large public sector blood banks, uh, there's a lot of pilferage uh, uh, of blood and um, blood from these large blood banks goes uh, and is available in the small uh, commercial blood banks in the vicinity of uh, large uh, hospitals. Um, another problem was that uh, our blood banks were not managed properly uh, by proper professionals, uh, pathologists or rheumatologists. And in many cases, even the public sector blood banks were managed by and technicians and uh, even those technicians uh, didn't have uh, proper qualifications and most of the uh, technical staff have learned their uh, skills uh, on the job. Um, for our blood supply, the major reliance um, the, in the past used to be on family replacement donors, which is now being shifted towards voluntary blood donors. Um, and um, because uh, there would always be shortage of blood, so there was no proper system of pre-donation uh, screening. Blood was collected first and screened later. And in many places, even now, um, uh, blood screening is done uh, even in the large public sector hospitals um, in Punjab. They are done on uh, very cheap quality manual um, uh, screening kits. And so this is one of the leading drivers of uh, hepatitis epidemic uh, in the country. And as a result, uh, we have high uh, seroprevalence of uh, hepatitis B and HCV and even HIV relatively uh, among our uh, blood donors who are apparently healthy individuals um, uh, from the society. Um, another technical problem that uh, we have in our blood banks is that the blood grouping is not done uh, properly. Um, most of the time it's only forward grouping, no reverse grouping. And even the method that is used uh, is a slide method uh, instead of the recommended uh, tube method. Uh, and cross match uh, is usually uh, not performed because of the heavy workload and lack of awareness and uh, so many other issues. Uh, then on the bedside, uh, uh, transfusion reactions are common, but they are not uh, documented, unfortunately. So um, 10 years ago, what was happening was and that um, all the blood banks uh, in the uh, uh, hospital, for example, in Islamabad, in PIMS, Polyclinic, Capital Hospital, um, we would have small blood banks in two, three room uh, um, setting where uh, blood donors were mobilized, and mostly patients, um, uh, family members, and blood was collected, component prepared, screening done, uh, other uh, testing of the blood done. Uh, components prepared, stored in the same uh, place, and then compatibility done, testing done, and then blood issued uh, to the patients in the ward. And this all same uh, set of work was being done in PIMS, in Polyclinic, Capital Hospital, and 20 other um, um, hospital-based blood banks uh, in the city. So this was duplication of resources, uh, many cases, substandard screening, and suboptimal utilization of resources, which was resulting in a lot of wastage of uh, blood. Clearly, this was a very undesirable um, situation. So to fix this uh, sad state of affairs, uh, the health ministry and the government decided to fix the blood transfusion system in the country with the help of uh, the German uh, government, which very generously offered uh, 17 million euro grant uh, to fix the blood system in the country. And um, at that time, I was in the National AIDS Control Program and I was given the responsibility to uh, manage uh, this uh, grant and uh, come up with a plan to utilize it. So we uh, evolved uh, a consensus among all the provinces and the public sector and private sector and all the stakeholders and agreed to have a, a nationally coordinated system in the country like I presented in the first slide and um, this took us uh, two years to get all the plans prepared and get them approved from the government. In 2010, it was approved finally by the CDWP in Islamabad, six different PC ones. And, uh, and the next six years, we implemented the first phase uh, of the project. 
we faced many constitutional and administrative challenges, um, but we managed to survive and not only survive, but also implement and the project successfully on ground as a result of which the German government offered Pakistan government uh, another round of funding um, in which the size and scope of the project was further expanded. So this was the model um, that uh, we worked on and to implement uh, the uh, transfusion reforms in the country. We proposed uh, establishment of large modern regional blood centers all over the country to serve as blood production sites. And these um, uh, modern centers uh, would be supporting the existing hospital-based blood banks would, which would be re renovated and upgraded uh, through this uh, project. So um, uh, in other words, we would be having um, separation of blood production uh, from blood utilization. And this is the international recommendation that the blood production site should be different um, uh, and uh, it should be coordinated and consolidated and blood utilization should be in the hospital settings where the patients are placed and uh, these two sites should be completely different from each other. And so in the modern blood centers that uh, we propose to build, um, the functions would be uh, to mobilize voluntary blood donors, collect blood uh, in these centers and also in the mobile settings prepare component from every unit of blood collected, uh, process the blood uh, for screening and component preparation, store the components at respective uh, um, uh, storage conditions, and then transport the prepared blood components um, uh, from these uh, regional blood centers to the linked uh, hospital blood banks. And each uh, regional blood center was linked to six existing hospital-based uh, blood banks, which were upgraded for this purpose. And their role was also uh, revised and remodeled. And uh, now they were not expected to uh, do any uh, production, blood production or component preparation or screening. They were just expected to receive the prepared blood components from the um, uh, blood centers, store them at appropriate conditions and issue them to the patients in the wards um, and uh, ensure the principles of uh, Hemovigilance. So this was uh, the international model that we also proposed um, in 2010. And by 2016, uh, we were successful in completing this infrastructure and we developed these 10 modern regional blood centers all over the country in different cities in different provinces. And all each of these um, regional blood center was supporting, um, as I said, uh, six uh, hospital-based blood banks uh, uh, within reach of these uh, um, uh, regional blood centers. And um, all these blood centers uh, were funded by the German government funds. And uh, not only just the building, but also uh, uh, modern equipment was also provided and the furnishing was also provided through the uh, German funds. Uh, and then uh, one by one, these centers were completed and uh, we started going about uh, all over the country and inaugurating them and high profile functions in which um, the uh, local uh, partners, the health ministers or the chief ministers or the governors uh, would um, uh, gladly participate in the inauguration ceremony along with the uh, German partners, uh, uh, KFW and the German ambassadors also sometimes. <clears throat> so in the meantime, while the, and these large buildings were being uh, constructed, um, we were working on the technical, the soft side of the project so that um, uh, when the infrastructure is ready, we wanted the new system to work according to the recommended guidelines and practices. And we didn't want to have the same kind of practices and work being done in the new buildings uh, like it was being done in the existing blood bank. So among the important things uh, um, that we covered uh, technically was the first was and the most important was uh, uh, to develop policy. And we um, worked um, not only on the national um, policies, uh, but we also contributed in the development of the WHO regional uh, framework on blood safety. And um, <clears throat> we also, for the first time, got included blood safety and thalassemia prevention um, in the national health vision 
uh, and the importance of this was um, uh, um, tremendous because unless you have uh, something uh, listed or identified as a priority area in the national health policy, uh, you cannot get a, a resource allocation for that. So this was very important from this point of view. We also reviewed and we revised uh, the national blood policy uh, and the strategic framework and the national blood donor policy was also reviewed and revised. On the basis of these policies, um, we did a lot of work on legislation and regulation. Also, um, the um, blood transfusion or the blood safety laws in the country were uh, developed a long time ago uh, during the period 1997 and 2004. Um, and uh, all the provinces had their own uh, legislation uh, developed during this period. And strangely, um, the provinces didn't talk to each other while they were doing this very important work with the result that uh, the laws uh, are there in the provinces, but they are not uniform. They are not standardized. And now they were not even up to date because transfusion medicine is a rapidly evolving um, field. And moreover, um, these laws were never really seriously implemented. So um, uh, we did a lot of technical work uh, to increase advocacy and comprehension about legislation and regulation. And we developed some very important technical documents, especially functional briefs on the role and responsibility of blood transfusion authority. Another important document that we developed was a field manual for the inspectors to have unbiased inspections by the technical experts. And um, we also um, then uh, decided that we need to have um, an up, uh, updated uh, legislation in the country. And for that, we developed consensus and we worked on the European model of legislation and adopted it uh, for Pakistan and all the provinces agreed on this draft. And uh, some of the provinces have already um, applied it uh, um, and passed it through their uh, legislature. Uh, <clears throat> until um, the blood transfusion program was established in uh, 2010, uh, regulation uh, was very weak. Uh, the laws were there, the transfusion authorities were notified, but they were not really functional in proper sense of work. And so we did, uh, in addition to developing these technical documents, we did a lot of capacity building um, for the uh, inspectors and the stakeholders who were uh, inspected, uh, created a lot of awareness. Uh, and we especially worked for the advocacy with the policymakers and especially the health uh, ministry personnel. Um, and the most successful aspect of this work on regulation was that uh, um, in 2013, I was given the responsibility to revive um, the Islamabad Blood Transfusion Authority uh, which had a mandate of uh, only the Islamabad capital territory, uh, but uh, we were successful in developing a very good um, and uh, workable model uh, suited for the national needs in the federal capital. And as a result of this, um, we uh, properly licensed all the blood banks uh, in Islamabad. Uh, we built their capacities and ensured that uh, they did work uh, according to the uh, recommended national guidelines. And we would also collect uh, data from these uh, blood banks and bring out annual report and the website. And um, uh, you know this work was very uh, widely acknowledged and not only uh, within the country, but also internationally um, uh, by WHO. And we also presented this work uh, on many international forums and national co international conferences. <clears throat> Um, voluntary blood donation is another um, key uh, um, um, you know, aspect of uh, the project because uh, blood provides the raw material for this project. And unless the raw material is of the right quality, uh, you can never have the desired results. Uh, and the best quality donor uh, are the voluntary, regular, non-remunerated donors. Um, and so we did a lot of homework um, to develop the uh, base uh, for promotion of voluntary blood donation. We didn't right away go into promoting blood donation in the beginning because um, um, you know our infrastructure was not ready at that time. And if we mobilize the donors without the infrastructure being ready, and the mobilized donors going to the same old um, you know not very good blood centers, the work would have been counterproductive. 
So we did this work gradually. And the most important uh, thing that we did um, in this period was to develop a partnership uh, with the social media giant, uh, Facebook. And um, this was a very interesting experience for us. Uh, they came to us in 2018, um, start of 2018, and told us that they have developed a, a special tool for promoting voluntary blood donation. And they are piloting in, in four countries, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Brazil. And um, Pakistan was the only country out of these four countries where there was a national counterpart in the, in the shape of safe blood transfusion program where uh, um, Facebook could work with. And so when they shared their feature with us, uh, um, I was actually horrified to uh, see what they had uh, developed. Uh, there, there were a lot of inconsistencies in it and uh, a lot of things were not in conformity with the international recommendations. And the worst part was that there, there was no technical input um, in uh, developing this uh, uh, and this tool. And uh, this was very surprising uh, for us because this was something in which Mike Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, who is a, who is a oncologist, I believe, uh, were personally involved with. And their philosophy was uh, that uh, they wanted to um, help people who need blood. So they just connected uh, people who can donate blood uh, with people who need blood and uh, you know, completely bypassing the system. So these were some of the glaring um, you know, uh, irregularities uh, or wrong things that uh, were in their uh, tool. And when we pointed them out, uh, it took us some time to convince them, but uh, gradually they realized uh, that uh, what we were telling them made sense. And um, so they improved and reformed their uh, tool. And now <clears throat> this tool is uh, being used uh, um, in many developing countries and also uh, in United States. And uh, I had um, the uh, pleasure of presenting this experience of working uh, with uh, Facebook uh, two years ago in uh, um, uh, Switzerland in an international conference in Basel, where it was very well received. And, now, especially during the COVID crisis, this uh, tool is being used in many blood banks in Pakistan uh, with a lot of success. Um, <clears throat> uh, HR uh, development is another key aspect of, of our uh, uh, work and focus um, because uh, without uh, improving the uh, people uh, and their practices and their mindset, um, you know, it's no good. Uh, investing in the infrastructure and equipment. So human capacity development was one of our main focus uh, right from the start and we conducted many um, uh, different uh, capacity building workshops on uh, different aspects all over the country in different cities with different stakeholders, developed many documents also and all these activities were participated by a lot of um, uh, people very enthusiastically and uh, we, but the real uh, improvement or uh, reform in the HR sector uh, can only come about through long-term um, degree and diploma programs. And we developed uh, uh, this uh, uh, curriculum document also um, uh, in 2016 uh, for the benefit of uh, doctors and technicians and nurses. And um, <clears throat> um, uh, we coordinated uh, with the uh, regulators, uh, the Higher Education Commission, the PMDC, CPSP, and we received a lot of uh, support and cooperation from them. And uh, this work was done through the support of uh, our working groups and technical um, uh, task forces. And uh, and this, uh, uh, a lot of uh, national experts participated and uh, they were very generous uh, with their time. And a lot of, uh, in some cases, uh, foreign experts were also involved. Um, quality is a, it's a, it's a big issue in the country um, in all walks of life. And uh, blood banking is no exception. Uh, we lack uh, quality culture. So we worked a lot on uh, introducing the concepts of uh, quality management system in our blood banking. And we developed a lot of uh, um, uh, manuals and SOPs and guidelines and, uh, and all these were well suited for the national uh, use. 
they were based on international documents, but they were, um, you know, reformed a lot and adopted uh, for use um, in the country. And we also promoted um, uh, advanced technology and automation, um, especially gel card and plaque emulsions and that screening were promoted um, uh, through the Safe Blood Transfusion Program and also through the regulatory authority. Is, and uh, we also did a lot of work on improving data management uh, practices. And all these documents um, uh, were very painstakingly um, uh, prepared and they are being used uh, in a lot of uh, blood banks uh, even now. Um, when the new infrastructure became ready and uh, we started operationalizing the centers, we realized that a lot of our clinicians were still following obsolete uh, uh, blood prescription practices and they were still fond of uh, prescribing fresh whole blood um, uh, for their patients, especially uh, the gynecologist and uh, the surgeons. Um, so uh, we started focusing on uh, rational use of blood and we held many um, dialogues in different um, cities, especially places where uh, we had developed these regional blood centers and uh, we developed some important documents also. These are small, handy, um, easy to use documents and they are very popular and um, they now need to be upgraded also by someone. Uh, but uh, uh, these were very popular documents. Uh, trainings were also very popular and uh, they made a lot of difference. And uh, the trend of whole blood prescription is on the decline, but this is something, the training especially are something which needs to be a constant feature uh, um, because, uh, um, you know, it's not easy uh, to change the habits uh, uh, which have developed over a long period of time. Management and information system were also developed for the new infrastructure. This was special customized uh, um, uh, systems that we developed indigenously through our own national um, IT experts. And uh, now some of uh, these systems are even being used in some uh, um, Middle Eastern countries. And, uh, um, you know, all the regional blood centers are linked uh, to each other um, and with the head offices in Islamabad through the help of this uh, management information system. And to start with, we developed this very important functional brief, uh, which spelled out uh, the purpose of developing um, uh, um, uh, uh, management information system. And this was basically for the benefit of the IT experts who were developing um, uh, this system. And this is also very useful um, uh, for the other experts also. So these functional briefs uh, we developed for a lot of things uh, which proved to be very useful uh, for all the people involved. When we started the uh, project in uh, 2010, there was hardly any research publications from Pakistan published uh, and international or even national um, journals. Um, but with the passage of time, um, a lot of uh, uh, research articles started um, uh, being published uh, uh, in the country. Uh, most of them initially were from Islamabad, from, from, from our office, um, but um, gradually from the provinces also, uh, people were encouraged. And uh, if you Google, you will find a lot of publications um, uh, in high impact journal. Um, in the last 10 years. And a lot of this work has been uh, presented in international conferences also. And um, we received support from a lot of industry partners and also the key international partners, uh, the global partners. So this was a very encouraging uh, uh, development. And I would encourage you, in fact, to Google and, uh, and see for yourself um, the different uh, uh, publications on different aspects of uh, blood transfusion, which are now available. And this uh, also means that a lot of evidence has been generated uh, during this time uh, from Pakistan, which was not the case earlier. Another important work that we did was uh, that we, uh, um, for the first time, um, started collecting data from the ground, uh, that is from individual blood bank uh, throughout the country. Uh, and uh, before that, we uh, never had uh, true statistics uh, uh, about any aspect of uh, blood banking. But uh, after 2015, 
we started getting uh, data and we would uh, um, present that uh, in the form of a annual report every year. And this data was compiled and analyzed um, uh, comprehensively. <clears throat> Gradually, the quality of data also started improving because the blood banks realized uh, that uh, the Safe Blood Transfusion Program is going to come uh, to them at the end of every year and ask for them to provide data on the prescribed forms. So data management also uh, started improving. And, um, and so now we can very confidently say that um, uh, until two years ago, uh, we were collecting about 2.7 million units of blood every year from about 600 blood banks um, all over the country. And um, there's still a lot of room for improvement uh, in data management. Most of the blood banks still do it manually, but uh, as long as their management data management practices are fine, um, manual record keeping is also acceptable. But uh, in a modern blood banking uh, era, we should be promoting automation um, in data management also. And this uh, you know, increases um, uh, improvement, uh, it causes uh, um, you know, efficiency in working, and also it brings about transparency and uh, pill phrase is also discouraged um, this way. Thalassemia is very important and very closely linked to the blood system. Um, um, we all know that Pakistan is uh, one of the highest uh, burden countries um, in the world. Um, people say that about 100,000 uh, thalassemia patients exist in the country. Uh, I think this number is exaggerated, but still uh, the number is huge. And so the burden on the blood system is also huge. And this is one reason why we have so many um, thalassemia centers uh, in the NGO sector um, in the country. And um, unfortunately, um, thalassemia is spreading unchecked uh, uh, in the country because we don't have a national um, thalassemia policy and this, um, the government is not really doing anything um, to check the, uh, the spread of this uh, preventable blood disorder. But from the platform of Safe Blood Transfusion Program, we try to get all the stakeholders together um, and also involve WHO, Thalassemia Federation of Pakistan and the International Thalassemia Federation and, uh, and develop a consensus uh, among all the stakeholders that we should have a national policy which should uh, spell out um, what needs to be done on all the different aspects of uh, uh, thalassemia prevention, legislation, uh, communication, treatment, transfusion, uh, chelation therapy, all these uh, different aspects must be covered in the policy. Uh, but someone needs to take this up further and uh, um, so that the policy is finally developed. Uh, then there were a lot of experts which came to Pakistan um, and during this 10 year period. And uh, those of you familiar with transfusion medicine would recognize some of these world renowned um, uh, figures. And uh, some of them came to Pakistan more than uh, once. And um, um, they got a chance to visit different parts of Pakistan, meet different experts and see for themselves the, the work that we were doing to transform the blood sector in the country. And uh, so they went back with very good impression and the blood community now uh, is very excited um, and uh, you know following the developments of uh, the blood system uh, reforms in the country and before the establishment of the program in the country no one from the blood community had ever visited uh, Pakistan. So these are again some of that uh, very important technical documents that we developed and they are all available on our website hopefully. Um, and uh, um, you know, many blood centers are using these documents. They need to be revised, reviewed, and updated regularly. And uh, the new leadership in the program, it is now their responsibility to do that. Um, we um, try to promote the program as much as possible. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we, we, we would use different occasions like uh, Blood Donor Day, Thalassemia Day, Hemophilia Day, or opening of the new centers, uh, or um, inauguration of some activities. Um, and we would invite uh, high-profile guests like uh, uh, the AJK president here or the G20 
chief minister of uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan donating blood air or the president of Pakistan inaugurating our conference. And this would provide us, these uh, uh, occasions would provide us very good opportunity to highlight our uh, achievements and seek uh, political commitment uh, from the government. We also got opportunities for, to present our work at the, uh, in the parliament, uh, in the standing committees, and we were very fortunate to receive appreciation from them also. And these are some of the um, important remarks from some very important uh, um, leadership, national leadership, as well as uh, the German leadership and the WHO. And all these uh, partners and um, <clears throat> figures were very appreciative of the work that we had done under very um, challenging uh, uh, circumstances. Um, uh, one of the greatest benefit of uh, doing all this hard work uh, was that uh, we got to see and the world. Uh, we got invitations from different parts of the world in, um, to present our work in conferences, uh, to participate in international meetings and consultations. And uh, in the beginning, I would be going and representing Pakistan alone in all these forums, but gradually um, uh, a lot of other experts from the provinces and other officials uh, started joining me and getting invitations. And we worked with all these international um, and then global partners uh, to promote um, blood transfusion uh, system uh, in the country and share with the uh, partners the important work that we were doing in Pakistan. And everyone was very appreciative and supportive of the good work that we were doing. Um, this work was uh, um, you know, uh, uh, covered a lot in the electronic media uh, and the print media also. And WHO um, uh, was uh, after uh, the Germans, they were the most important partners for us and uh, the most important technical partner. And they were uh, constantly supporting um, the reforms process in the country. Um, we were very active um, uh, in the communication sector, very active in all uh, the social media. We would bring out a, a monthly newsletter electronically every month and share it with hundreds of partners uh, in the country and uh, outside the country. And we also <clears throat> brought out annual reports, uh, program report, uh, the PTA report, and the World Blood Donor Day report. And uh, these were also followed uh, and uh, appreciated very much. June 14, uh, we would always celebrate very enthusiastically all over the country. Again, this happened only after the establishment of the program. And you can see in these pictures, a lot of people with very happy faces participating very actively in these uh, um, uh, um, activities. Um, and uh, as a result of this all-inclusive uh, policy of the Safe Blood Transfusion Program, uh, we gradually became uh, recognized as the national platform and national voice of blood safety in Pakistan. And the government, the federal government, as well as the provincial government would always approach us whenever they needed advice or consultation about any aspect of um, blood transfusion. And also from outside the country, um, whenever they wanted information about Pakistan or wanted to invite um, uh, uh, blood people from Pakistan, they would um, approach the Safe Blood Transfusion Program. So this is the current footprint of the project uh, in Pakistan. You can see we have presence all over the country or in all the provinces. And this is phase one and phase two infrastructure. Uh, phase two infrastructure has just been completed a few months ago, yet to be operationalized, but the phase one infrastructure is uh, providing service uh, since uh, 2016. And uh, two of the provinces, Punjab and Sindh, decided uh, to operate uh, their services through public-private partnership. And uh, this has been uh, an excellent experience and um, if you happen to go to Mutan, Bhalpur, Jamshur, or Sakkar um, and visit our regional blood centers, you will be amazed to see a real international level uh, standard uh, work being done in these um, regional blood centers. In other provinces, um, the centers are being run um, by the health department themselves, although they are also contemplating outsourcing their regional blood centers but uh, they have not done so yet. Uh, and the phase two infrastructure um, sadly is ready for uh, 
quite a few months now and should have been uh, freshened, but uh, uh, not so, so far. So this is the final slide. The way forward now is that the second phase of the project is coming to an end uh, in December and the German support will also cease uh, um, with the end of the second phase for a simple reason that no one has asked them yet to continue uh, for another round of funding. Um, and the other important thing is that since I retired from the program last year in February and the program has witnessed uh, um, um, a lot of uh, leadership uh, changes as a result of which the reforms momentum has become stalled and the phase two infrastructure which should have become operational by now is still not operational. And the supervision of the phase one uh, infrastructure is not there anymore. National data collection is suspended and the blood transfusion regulation work is disrupted. Blood transfusion authorities are not really functional anymore. Um, the staff in the blood transfusion, say blood transfusion program at the federal level have not been paid their salaries. The PC1 has expired and no one uh, has any plan to, uh, to uh, you know, um, uh, revive it. So there's an urgent intervention which is required to save this uh, uh, um, you know, success story from going sour. And the best way forward would be to outsource all the um, phase one and phase two um, regional blood centers and uh, hand them over to credible um, uh, private partners um, uh, as was done in Punjab and Sindh in the phase one of uh, the project. And I will end this uh, presentation by sharing with you the best kept secret uh, of uh, Islamabad. And these are the pictures of the marvelous um, building of uh, Islamabad Blood um, Regional Blood Center, which is ready for the last uh, nine, 10 months. Um, it is fully equipped and it is fully staffed uh, and the staff is not even getting salary now, but uh, um, this uh, brilliant building and um, infrastructure has yet to become operationalized. I hope uh, it becomes operational soon uh, and it starts performing for the role that it has been designed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Uh, you have wonderfully taken us through the development of uh, blood transfusion, safety of the blood transfusion through the capacity building and uh, to the maintenance, to development of these regulations, especially the European style regulation in 2013. Plus you have shown innovation in that for how to data collect as well as some research and workshop and above all the branding. But I was a little disappointed of seeing your last slide that the, the entire work is seems like, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, is, is, is a little in, in hazards. So uh, my first question to you is um, how difficult you think is the implementation of legislation in Pakistan? It's not difficult. I mean, we have shown in Islamabad, you know, uh, the regulation uh, we managed to do um, regulation in Islamabad without any resource allocation with zero budget. And we managed to come up with a, with a very effective and efficient model of regulation. Islamabad is a limited area, uh, but the model developed uh, uh, can be applied to any other city and province in the country. And we did go about uh, in different uh, places and uh, try to help the provincial blood transfusion authorities and um, um, getting them started. And we got some uh, good results also, but uh, maintaining the momentum was an issue. Uh, we needed to have uh, proper suitable leadership uh, in the regulatory authorities. That has not been the case so far. Uh, but um, your question about uh, uh, difficulty in implementing legislation, uh, no problem, uh, provided you have the right leadership. Thank you. We have with us um, uh, Dr. Uzair as well as uh, Sarvath Hussain. They are both very well known to the Apna married uh, participants and the audience. Um, Dr. Uzair, you have a question to ask? <clears throat> yes, thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Akhtar and uh, Dr. Hassan Abbas, please accept my heartiest congratulations. What a great project, what a great achievement. I think that is one of the exemplary project in the history, healthcare history of Pakistan, because <clears throat> I think uh, that was the focus you brought in. That was the leadership you brought in. And, you know, single-handedly, you took it to the ultimate level. And I think uh, this is one of the best healthcare project in Pakistan. And all the parameters were achieved during that time. But the unfortunate part is this, that, you know, sustainability. And uh, if it's not performing, so it is because of only and only the, the governors and the uh, you know efficiency issues on part of the healthcare leadership and the political leadership. This is really very unfortunate because I'm privy to many of uh, these steps. So <clears throat> I have just a very, very um, small question. You mentioned that there are few unorganized uh, blood banking services and they are screening the blood with the very old fashioned primitive devices, which are not acceptable in any part of the world. So my question is, can we uproot those practices by involving the regulator? I mean, <clears throat> the drug regulatory authority of Pakistan medical devices that they should put a ban because I articulated uh, this issues with full force with the healthcare task force, which is the ultimate body in Pakistan. To in, in terms of policy and uh, they promised and they also asked the chief executive officer of DRAP really to take action and uh, give their suggestion how and when can we do that and I think there is a good buying out at that level with the health task force so uh, do you see that is there any other mechanism other than the regulation to stop these practices? Yes, uh, I think uh, like in Punjab, uh, you know, why does the health department buy uh, such uh, poor quality kits? You know, uh, these kits cost, you know, 10 rupees uh, per kit, you know, what kind of quality can you get uh, with this cheap kit? And they are not even approved by DRAP. Um, so uh, I'm surprised, uh, you know, how they can continue uh, with this practice. Uh, I have, uh, you know, millions of times uh, told these uh, health departments to stop buying these uh, these kits. And, you know, even in a place like Mayo Hospital, you know, they're using these uh, um, substandard kits and it's better not to just um, spend even these 10 rupees on these kits because they don't pick up any infection. So you might as well be, uh, um, you know, transfusing uh, blood without any screening at all. It is mind boggling why they do it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sarvath Hussain, uh, do you have a question for Professor Zaheer? Welcome to the panel. I think he's on mute. Oh, yeah. I have another Dr. question, Pro uh, Professor Zaheer, in the meantime. Um, yes. You mentioned about the voluntary um, donation. And if I remember correctly, there was a time where and there was no law, no legislation, and people were selling their blood. And I remember correctly, Dow Medical College, where the first PWA, Patient Welfare Association, was established because a lot of doctors were thinking at the time people are selling the blood without the screening, and especially those druggies, and they come and sell the blood, and they finally decided to screen and, and they started the blood bank. And I'm sure you're aware of that too. So nowadays, as Dr. Uzair mentioned, there is still screening is very, um, um, it's like, a, it's not at par at all. Um, so you mentioned that it's easy to apply the regis uh, legislation and implement, and then you can regulatory. Um, how about, um, those 600 blood banks, they are all um, complying to the, um, the uh, comply to the all the legislation. Um, you know, especially through the private banking, like Indus Hospital, like Dr. Sabha has mm -hmm. done a great job in that in terms of safety yeah. of uh, safety yeah, they, of blood. They are managing uh, 
they are managing, Indus is managing three of our uh, regional blood centers and they're doing a brilliant job, no doubt about it. Um, and in fact, there's a, the range of screening, uh, it's very wide, you know, on the one hand you have in Mayo Hospital these uh, useless kits being used for screening. And uh, on the other hand, um, in Lahore, you know, you have other places where NAT screening is being done. So NAT screening is becoming quite popular and more than one uh, service provider is there, which is a good competition also. So the price is also coming down. Uh, Chemiluminescence uh, screening is also becoming very popular. Um, so there is, uh, you know, the wide range of uh, standards uh, available, uh, but with the uh, operationalization of the large regional blood centers of the SBTP, many of the smaller blood centers have gone out of business. And these were the very dangerous centers which were doing very substandard work, substandard screening. So uh, the outcome of our project, uh, uh, um, um, good outcome, one of the good outcomes has been that um, the smaller um, scary blood banks, uh, a lot of them have gone out of business, especially in the south of Punjab, interior of Sindh. Uh, and if we can have more of uh, the large blood centers and if we can get our uh, phase two uh, regional blood centers operationalized, uh, the number of total number of blood banks will come down. Uh, we will have less blood banks, uh, but uh, better quality of service uh, and more work being done, being done in smaller number of blood banks, which would be economy of scales and improvement in standards also. Thank you. We have a question from Umar Hayat. Please go ahead and um, ask your question to Professor Zahid. Be, be, uh, be precise, please. I will be. Thank you. Um, amazing presentation. My question was, was there any document produced once the blood group is identified? Or is there uh, any effort to assign the blood group to the individuals and be uh, the part of the national ID? So uh, I'm not sure I gathered your question. Uh, you're talking about which document? Blood group. So I know in, in Pakistan, for example, for blood transfusion, you always need to know the blood group, the individual you're transferring yeah, yeah. the blood in. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. is there any sort of document in Pakistan which uh, bear the blood group? At the individual regional blood center level, uh, the record of all the patients, of the, all the donors is there and it is accessible uh, in Islamabad also, uh, if we go into the details. Uh, but no one has ever actually prepared a database of uh, uh, blood donors. This is something that should be done, but uh, it has not been done so far. Thank you, Professor Zair. We have Dr. Samia. Um, if, if you can introduce yourself and ask a question, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Samia. I am the PhD microbiologist. One question to ask, uh, uh, first of all, I will uh, congratulate to Hassan Abbas. It is a great uh, achievement to you and your team to develop this setup. But the, uh, uh, through blood transfusion and blood donation, uh, one major problem are the blood transfusion infection. We worked in one small uh, blood bank, so mostly out of 10 uh, blood donation, we get three uh, HIV and hepatitis infection patients in, um, positive result in our uh, center. So how can control to the, these infection, any, uh, and any system you develop, and this is a major issue for yes. transmission of hepatitis yes. and uh, HIV. Yes. I think well, what you need to do is, uh, there are basically three steps uh, for uh, screening. The first one is behavioral screening, uh, in which uh, uh, you ask a set of questions uh, to each donor. Uh, and this questionnaire helps you to identify the risk factors uh, in any potential donor. And uh, if you identify any risk factor, you know, the donor is out um, and you don't proceed further. The second step is, uh, a physical examination uh, to check uh, whether uh, 
the donor has fever, he, his weight is all right, he's not anemic, blood pressure and everything is all right. So that is the second step. If that is also fine, then you go ahead and collect the blood and do the uh, serological screening afterwards. Um, but if you don't do the first two steps and just collect the blood and do um, blood uh, screening, um, then you will find a lot of infections. But uh, if you had done the first two steps before um, uh, collecting the blood, um, you know, uh, uh, you would get less uh, infected cases uh, among your donors. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ozel, you have a comment or you have a question? Uh, I would just, uh, I responded and I wrote to Mr. Umar Hayat that now in Islamabad Capital Territory, the blood group is written on your driving license. <clears throat> so that was his question. Mm -hmm. But I would uh, definitely <clears throat> uh, request uh, Dr. Zahir really to comment on uh, Mr. Abdul Rashid because there is a case of pharmacovigilance and uh, <clears throat> he should. Uh, Maybe, you know, he should be asked to rephrase his question and uh, Dr. Zahir should respond to that question about the hemovigilance. Uh, I, there must be something else, yeah. I can't really believe uh, that uh, blood was transfused without checking the patient's group. Not possible, just not possible. You have to really go um, uh, and uh, visit uh, our uh, blood system in Multan, and you will be amazed, you know, at the at the standard of uh, um, uh, you know services being offered. And Multan was a particularly difficult station. There was such a lot of commercialization in Multan and Bhalpur. There were practically, you know, criminal mafias operating the uh, uh, in the sale and uh, uh, sale of blood. And uh, we managed to. Um, take on the mafia head on and eliminate them and replace that commercial system with an excellent system. And in the process, we faced a lot of challenges and uh, some of them were disinformation campaign in the media, in the electronic media, in the social media, in the print media. And perhaps um, this may be part of that also. I would urge you to go into the details and check it out. Uh, I don't really believe this thing happened. Okay, okay. thank you. So, uh, uh, Professor Zahir, I mean, uh, you have been involved heavily as a core team member in our uh, mm -hmm. this uh, co-manufacturing of this vaccine, CanSino Bio. Can you shed some lights where we are and how long it takes and how how it, where we are at this uh, joint juncture? Uh, the clinical trial is still ongoing. We are now in the follow-up phase. And uh, uh, we are now also doing testing on the booster dose, which was not part of the original um, uh, protocol. So uh, the trial will continue for another one year uh, uh, at least. Um, but the best outcome of this clinical trial has been that for the first time in the history of the country, we have actually started manufacturing vaccines uh, in the country. Um, NIH was not able to do that in the last 50, 60 years, but now, co-manufacturing of CanSino bio vaccine is taking place since April this year. And now every month we are producing 5 million doses of uh, COVID vaccine. This is no small achievement. It is an amazing uh, achievement which needs to be highlighted uh, and is not being highlighted uh, at the moment. No, I think the NIH is in the wonderful hands of Professor uh, Major General Amir Akram, and he's a doer. And since his um, inception, the NIH has been doing a wonderful job, and this is one of another uh, huge milestone. Uh, before yeah, I end this, I can partnership, see... if I may add. Yes. Is, is Dr. Sarvat, do you have any question or comment before we, uh, we are ending, about to end our webinar session? My, my only comment is that I would really like to congratulate uh, Professor Hassan Abbas Zahid for his uh, description of the progress that he and his group has made. And honestly, I find it to some extent unbelievable, but I 
would believe it because it's coming from Professor, Professor Abbas, that things have turned around so much because personally I have seen things about nearly actually three years ago in Lahore at May Hospital Blood Bank. Things were um, not, you know, there were a lot, lot, lot to be achieved. And um, the only thing I can say is obviously optimism is good and especially achieving so much is even better. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to thank you, my panels, Dr. Zaid, Dr. Sarwat, and especially Professor Zaheer, uh, giving us a wonderful uh, landscape of uh, blood transfusion safety in Pakistan, especially the commendable achievements he has done. But I'm also um, a little worried about his last slide, and I'm sure we have participants with from different walk of life in Pakistan, from DRAB, from H. Uh, Higher Education Commission from NIH. And I'm sure the message is very loud and clear. You put in the slide and hopefully things will turn around and you will continue to um, you know, give us a, a you know, healthy and uh, safe transfusion for Pakistani uh, community. And thank you very much and Allah Hafiz. Thank you very much.